everybody. Welcome to the September 8th. It's September 8th, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Welcome to the September 8th meeting of the Dover Sherburne Regional School Committee. My name is Maggie Sharon, and I call this meeting to order at 7.32 p.m. This open meeting is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020. Information on how to join school committee meetings and agendas is posted on the Dover Sherburne District website. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and be aware that anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Um, we're going to begin tonight with public comment. Um, community comments are an opportunity for members of the community, sorry, to be heard. We respectfully request that you make your comments brief and that you move the discussion forward by adding new information. Please try to avoid repeating points that have already been made this evening. Uh, for community comments, I'm gonna ask that you virtually raise your hand and that you wait to be called on. When you speak, please begin by stating your name and whether you live in Dover, Sherburne, or Boston. Community comments are an opportunity for the school committee to listen to members of the community. It is not a forum for answering questions or engaging in the debate. Once pu the public comment section of the meeting has been concluded, we will move on to other business and unsolicited comments from the community will no longer be permitted. This is standard operating procedure in school committee meetings across our school districts and I thank you. I also just wanna make note that I I'm going to um, entertain school school committee comments for probably no more than um 20 minutes and and that's really it's not to shut down community comments i understand there might be many people who want to speak tonight but it, it really is because we need to get our business done and and we also need to go it's a school night for all of the professionals who work here so pe people do need to go to bed at, at a reasonable hour so just as you're hearing community comments if if something you wanted to say has already been said i just respectfully ask that, that you consider, you know, letting somebody else's comment stand for what you needed to say. And, and with that caveat, um, is there anyone in the community who wishes to make a comment? I just ask that you use the raise hand feature on Zoom and, and I, will, I will call on you. Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you. So we're, we're going to um, get to the first item of um, on our agenda, which is our main item on our agenda, and that's um, discussing our um, proposal, the district's proposal regarding sports. Andrew, did you want to start? And yeah. <clears throat> yes, can, can you hear me? We can. I have a really snowy screen. I have no idea why that is, so if my... Uh audio breaks up just give me a signal or something it's okay your um, your audio is crystal clear and I, I was thinking maybe it was just a retro filter i don't know what it is i'll figure it out but anyway um well thank you very much uh glad that we were able to arrange this meeting have this conversation um we uh we have there's been a lot of work and conversation going on behind the scenes related to athletics uh, I'm so glad that Emily Sullivan, our athletic director, and John Smith, our high school headmaster, are here for the conversation. Um, I'm going to ask that, uh, that uh, Emily outline what she is envisioning for the fall sports, uh, and, but I will share with you that, uh, that I know that Matt Vitale is here. I'm not sure if Kay Peterson is here, but Matt from the Sherburn Board of Health, uh, Kay from the Dover Board of Health. Uh, both boards have been uh, working with Emily uh, to discuss uh, an, an athletics advisory. So this is, in my mind, the right way to do things instead of us just uh, randomly moving forward and then finding out that our Board of Health is not happy with it. We actually consulted the Board of Health, showed them what Emily had in mind and what she was thinking in, uh, in relation to what's going on in the Tri-Valley League and then they, uh, they weighed in. And so the, uh, the athletics advisory that I shared in your packet has both Sherburn and Dover Boards of Health's approval. 
obviously because we're in Dover, it's really Dover that makes the, the decision, uh, but it's good to have both boards uh, together on this. And, um, and I suspect there may be some questions about, uh, I know I've already heard a few uh, that we may need to address along the way, but uh, Emily, do you mind just giving a, a synopsis of what we're envisioning for, uh, for athletics this fall? By the way, I'm asking for the school committee to vote on this. Actually, um, the, uh, the language, the guidance from the state said that school committees vote on, uh, if you're in a remote status, if your district is in a red status, then the school committees have to vote if they're gonna bring back athletics. But technically, as I understand it, because we're in a gray area, meaning we have less than five uh, cases per 100,000, we, you don't necessarily have to vote this. I'm asking for your vote because I think it's important to have all of us together on this. That's, uh, I do support uh, the proposal that Emily has brought forth and the health advisory um, from the boards of health. Yeah, I can, um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. I have headphones in. Um, I don't know if it'd be easiest for me to share my screen. Not that I'm gonna go through every slide at all, but just um, kind of give you a quick overview of that. I, I think that'd be terrific. Um, I, I, I think that'd be terrific because I know a lot of folks on the call maybe haven't had a chance to see, you know, the packet. I, I know it's uploaded to different websites, but that'd be fantastic. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. All right. All right. So. Um, as you guys all know, it's been a long process throughout this. Canceling the spring season was very difficult. Um, and we're just so thankful for the patience that the student athletes, the parents, the community all have. Um, so after receiving a lot of guidance from the EEA, the uh, DESE, the MIAA, and our league, the Tri-Valley League, we really do, with all of those things put together, we put together um, a very comprehensive plan that we feel touches on every aspect. So to start, hopefully you guys have seen this. The MIAA came out and voted to add a fall season two, which is also going to be referred to as the floating season. This floating season is going to entail football um, and for most leagues, volleyball, which we do not have, and cheer, which we do not have. So fall season one, the earliest practice tryout date is Friday, September 18th and the season ends no later than November 20th. There will, no, there will be no state tournaments this fall. They're gonna vote on that season to season. Winter will probably be sometime mid November that they make that decision to see where we are. So um, winter season, you'll see, see those dates there and the spring season, you'll see those dates there. So it has been adjusted to accommodate for this late delay um, with the fall season. Um, spring season running into July 3rd and all of that is obviously to be determined based off of state tournaments. So in regards to the fall season one, what will we offer as a league? Varsity and JV COA golf, which we're proposing that tryouts begin Friday, September 18th, which is the earliest day we can start. Um, and the first contest would be Thursday, September 24th. The reason for them starting a little earlier is that they, um, they run into daylight issues and they their season is always just a little bit shorter than the rest of our fall sports. So we propose that they start a little bit earlier than everyone and then also they're, they're off campus and they're the lowest risk sport that we're offering. So we feel a little more comfortable starting them before everyone else who practices and plays on campus. So varsity girls and boys cross country tryouts begin on Saturday, September 26th. Taking into account that that is an SAT date, we would start practices around noon. And then the first contest is Saturday, October 10th. Same with varsity JV and JV2 boys soccer, which is always to be determined based on numbers. Same for girls soccer, varsity JV and JV2, and then varsity and JV field hockey. And then as I said before, um, football is gonna be moved to the fall season two, which runs February 22nd to April 25th. So the EEA came out with risk levels, um, which I'm sure you've all seen. This has been out for a while. Golf and cross country being in the lower risk, field hockey, boys soccer and girls soccer being in moderate risk, football being in a higher risk. So 
some information from our league. So we talked a lot about how we can most safely have games against each other. And we thought it was best to divide the league into two different pods based off of geographic distance between each other. And then also keeping it even between the large and the small teams. So our league typically splits up between the large and the small, us being in the small. So you'll see pod one. And then pod two is our pod, Dedham, Medfield, Millis, Norwood, and Westwood. So we would play only the teams in our pod for games. There would be no cross pod play. Um, if a JV2 team didn't have a game, they would have to do some sort of an inner squad scrimmage. They wouldn't be able to pick up a game by playing another pod because we really want to keep it consistent of playing the same town every week as a school whole. So our boys and girls soccer team, cross country and field hockey team will all be playing Dedham the same weekend. They'll all be playing Medfield the same weekend and so on. Golf is a little bit ahead of that schedule because they start matches earlier. So practice sessions, we discussed in depth how practices are going to look um, and how we can keep it safe and consistent across the league. So we decided that practice sessions can take place during the preseason every day with one off day um, given a seven day period. That off day would be Wednesday due to our school being closed for cleaning. And the day off for golf will really depend on course availability. Typically they have two to three days off anyway due to course availability on the weekends. So that won't be a problem with them having that day off. Golf preseason will run, like I said, Friday, September 18th to Wednesday, September 23rd. And then the rest of the sports start September 26th. And preseason ends October 4th. So once that preseason is over, we will switch to only having three practice sessions a week. And then the games will be Saturday and Sunday. So teams can choose their three practice sessions. If it's Monday, Tuesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, the only day they cannot go is Wednesdays. So that'll allow um, some fields to open up and then also will allow for not all of the programs to be on campus after school at the same time. Teams will be operating under different practice schedules. JV and varsity will always be practicing separately in order to keep those cohorts consistent, which I'll cover in a little bit. They will be limited to two hours, 3.30 to 5.30. Um, that gets everyone off by 5.30 and also we're dealing with Triple E again this, this fall. So cohorts, just like we have cohorts in the classroom, we need to abide by cohorts in practice. The Board of Health recommended that we abide by the same cohorts that they're setting up in the classroom. So ninth and 10th graders would make up cohorts and 11th and 12th graders would make up cohorts. These cohorts wouldn't be any larger than 10, um, but you would have, you know, on a varsity team, you could have some ninth and 10th graders on varsity with, a bunch, with quite a few 11th and 12th graders. So that ninth and 10th grade cohort on varsity might look a little bit smaller than the 11th and 12th grade um, cohort. See. Coaches are going to be required to turn in these documents. They're going to be naming their cohorts after tryouts and these cohorts cannot change. So whether, you know, no matter what cohort you're in from day one of after the tryouts, it's going to have to remain the same to keep those cohorts the same. This season we will not have swing players, which is common um, in every other season across all three seasons. We will not implement the swing player rule and that's across the Tri-Valley. No one will have swing players. If you are on JV, you are on JV for the year. You can't play half of a JV game and then half of a varsity game. And that's just to keep the cohorts the same and making sure that these student athletes are sticking with the same groups of student athletes throughout practice. Training areas, surfaces, boundaries, they, um, they have to be marked so that cohorts are separated in all directions by 14 feet. Um, cohorts should be no larger um, than 10. Um, and then within a practice, there can't be more than 25 people on a playing surface. So a playing surface is really defined as anything with a 14 foot boundary from another playing surface. So you could split up the turf into two playing surfaces as long as they're separated by 14 feet. 
So no more than 25 people, including the coaches, can be within that playing surface. Student athletes who are in school on a practice day will be the only ones allowed in school in the bathrooms to change. So if you come to school, if you're a junior and you have practice on a Monday, you have to come to school dressed. We're recommending that you arrive to practice no earlier than five minutes before. And this is to help with traffic and buses, but also so you're not just hanging around um, and you're not you know, tempted to go in the school to use the bathrooms and the, um, to change and do other things. So we will have porta potties outside to use the restrooms um, and change if you need to, but we're recommending that you come from your house dressed ready to go for practice. This goes for um, games as well. All areas around the team bench and scores table must be sanitized between events. Um, our athletic trainer is going to be available at all athletic practice sessions with the exception of golf. She'll be in Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. She and I talked today um, and she's getting behind that schedule with um, her personal you know, child care and things. So that is gonna work out for her um, to be in six days a week once we start. All members must wear a face covering at all times with the exception of what is allowed with the EEA and MIA. Um, the MIAA has stated that when you're not actively involved in a drill or teaching session, team members must still remain socially distant at all times. And we have decided that the weight room and locker room is closed for fall season one. So this will not be open for any student athletes in season or out of season to run. Games, meets, and matches. So the Tri-Valley League has established um, that all of our games are gonna be take, taking place on Saturdays and Sundays with the exception of golf. Each school will play against the same school on that weekend. So if you're home on Saturday for a soccer game, you're gonna be away on Sunday at that same school. Cross country will run the races on Saturday with Sunday being used as a rain out. Um, and golf also is gonna be playing the same school that week back to back. It just isn't gonna match up um, as they start earlier. So this really limits our contact with um, other communities. It allows us to contact Trace a lot easier um, and once we're done playing Dedham, we're done playing Dedham for this season. There's going to be no league cham champion, no league tournament or state tournament. Um, this is something that is um, a bit new. Team rosters are going to be limited to 20 participants per team on a game or meet. So Teams can keep up to 25 players because you can have 20 um, or 23 players because you can have 25 players on a surface, assuming there's two coaches. You can only suit up 20 players per event. So um, coaches are going to have to take that into consideration. And if that you know, allows us to have a third team for certain programs, then we will definitely explore that. Golf rosters are going to remain at eight players per team for match. Um, and as of right now, which I know is a hot topic, fans will not be allowed at practices or games. We are exploring live streaming options um, by myself and the DS boosters who've been great throughout this process are willing to fund that um, so that we would be streaming all of our games. So our games would run from September 25th for golf to October 20th. For the other sports, October 10th to November 7th. We have a rain out weekend um, for November 14th. So if one of the games does get rained out or if the Board of Health decides we can't play a particular town, we can move it to that weekend. Um, once it's been moved to that weekend and other games get rained out, that's it. We can't make up any other matches other than that, um, that what we can fit in that weekend, which would be two. So the number of games will not exceed 10 games for soccer, field hockey and golf. Depending on the level, there could be less than 10 games um, and intra-squad scrimmages would be put in place um, on that Saturday um, due to other schools in our pod not offering that level. For example, JV2 boys soccer in our pod, Medfield and Westwood are the only two programs who offer that level. So that level would have four games and then 
have intra-squad scrimmages to take place on those other days when we play Denham Millis in Norwood. Cross country would not exceed five meets. Um, and I, I put this in because it does affect cross country more than the others due to our large numbers of cross country. Cross country roster is set for 20 boys and 20 girls per gender at a race. So those two races are gonna be an hour apart so they do not overlap. Um, so for the other runners who are not running in the race, they will be practicing only. Um, and our, the coaches and I still have to explore how that'll look. Um, and there's a lot of different options that we can explore on that, but um, it will be more of like a running club type environment if you're not racing that week. So event game management, um, like I said before, um, on uh, the principals in our league, along with the ADs met um, and voted not to allow fans at games, matches, or meets. And this is really to just provide the safest experience as possible. And our board of health was in a pretty strong agreement with that. Um, so the only people allowed to attend the game are student athletes, coaches, officials, and athletic trainer and game administrators. Teams that are arriving to DS on the weekends will come dressed and ready to play. Locker rooms will not be available for any teams. We'll have porta johns that are available for them to for restroom breaks and to change if they need to. Um, but teams are, will come ready um, along with our team as well. So all visiting team coaches will provide an accurate roster of all team members, including their coaches, cell phone number and email address. And this is for contact tracing so that we can, um, you know, in, in, in case there is um, an outbreak that we can um, start tracking that down. Um, hand sanitizer must take place while utilizing the Porter Jones at fields. All areas around team benches and score tables will be sanitized in between events. Hand sanitizer must be made available on both team benches and scores table along with disinfectant wipes um, and we will be sanitizing the balls throughout each contest. All coaches and event staff along with the student athletes will need to wear um, approved covering at all time which the Board of Health has stated is not um, does not include gators. The turf field is going to be disinfected um, on Wednesdays when the school is closed for cleaning. Uh, Chris Hendricks and his staff are going to disinfect that for us on Wednesdays. And it can, the reason we chose Wednesdays is because no one's on school campus, but also because there's a time frame when you cannot go um, and use the facility if it's been disinfected. It's um, because of the chemicals. So this also, um, in return, we'll keep, you know, non, um, I know a lot of people are worried about teams showing up on Wednesday and practicing anyway. Well, they, they won't be, they won't be able to for many reasons, but this field will be very unsafe because the chemicals um, needing to dry on the turf while it's being disinfected. All team benches and team members must remain socially distant at all times um, and they have to bring their own labeled water bottle. Transportation to sports is we are going to offer transportation as a family option, but this year we are requesting that it is not mandatory. We wanted student athletes and their families to feel as safe as possible to choose the best option for their family. So if they need a ride, we will absolutely provide it, but they are not required. They can ride on their own. JV and varsity will ride separate to adhere to those cohorts. Um, and also their game times away are at different times and they can't stay and watch the varsity after due to the, um, the attendance policy. So in your head, you might think that this is gonna require quite a few, bit more buses, um, which it is double the buses. However, there are a substantially less games that we have this season and there is no postseason, which um, last fall, all seven teams were in the postseason traveling to games. So it will, I've run the numbers and I do think it'll actually come out to be less buses. Golf um, is gonna need to transport by bus if all eight riders need to ride because the van does not fit them and their equipment while adhering to the transportation guidelines. 
if a few of them are able to drive on their own or wish to, then we could look into using the school van. Masks and face coverings have to be worn while on uh, buses or vans, and there is no eating or drinking while on those vans as well. So this is an area where I might skip through quite a bit. I, I'm happy to share the slide and I, um, and I think I'm sure everyone will want me to. There are individual sport modifications, which the MIAA um, and the EEA adopted. Um, every sport had their own committee and they took into different um, considerations when putting these forth together. And as a member of the MIAA, we have to abide by these sport um, modifications. Um, I'll just point out some of the main ones that I think you should know. The golf is not going to be mixing foursomes among schools. So our you know, golfers one through four will be playing together as DS and Dedham one through four will be playing together separately. So that's one modification that makes golf even safer. Um, there are you no know, handshakes, fists, elbow pumps among players. Scorecards are gonna be handed out by the coach who will have gloves on. Um, and there are, I've said this before, but there are no gaiters for um, golfers, for any of our athletes to wear. They must be worn um, and social distancing must be put in place in all common areas of the golf course. Um, and removal of face coverings is permitted during competition, but must be returned to the face anytime players need to be within six feet of each other. So due to golf and the swinging of the club, um, you really can't get very close to each other um, to keep it as safe as possible. Cross country, um, the face mask wearing is the same as, um, as golf. Only dual meets will be permitted. There will be no um, you know, MSTCA weekend meets that we often go to rent them. Uh, the Cape for the Twilight meet, those will not be permitted uh, this year as we will only be playing league meets. They recommend that we stack gender race, races an hour apart, which we have so that they don't overlap. And um, also putting in staggered starts so that everyone's finishing at different times, um, selecting a wider course. So we'll have to look into the course that we currently have and see if it fits. Um, and a non-transmitter way of scoring. Field hockey had quite a few modifications. The main one being they have changed the game from 11 v 11 to 7 v 7. Um, so that is a goalie and six players on the field. There are also, um, you'll see various different um, changes to the game of no penalty corners um, and things like that. Soccer also had quite a few modifications. One being um, they are staying to 11 v 11 and they are not allowed to do an intended header, an intended slide tackle and they can't have defensive walls um, where guys or girls lock arm in arm um, to create a defensive wall. So they've eliminated those. And the repercussion for doing those, which we know will happen because that is, um, you know, their muscle memory since they've played since they were five, is going to be a yellow card. Um, and I think the referees are really willing, you know, to come to a practice or something like that to discuss these new rules to try to make this as safe as possible for everyone. The athletic training room. I met with Tanya Gallagher today, who's our athletic trainer with ATI, and she's ready to go. Um, she will um, report to school um, approximately 2 p.m. Monday through Friday, with the exception of Wednesday, um, and available till you know, 6.30 when practice um, is ending at about 5.30. We're talking about setting up a tent for her somewhere outside so that the student athletes who come to school um, from virtual learning will be able to be taped and things like that outside since they're not gonna be allowed inside. On Saturday, she'll be coming in um, for the whole day and Sunday is usually a little less depending on which games and matches and meets we have that day. This is a little bit separate and a bit unrelated, but I thought it was um, important to note. The MIAA came out with Rule 40, um, which prohibits out of season coaching. And they actually reversed it per the approval of your um, principal. So the TVL voted on this to keep it fair within our league that they would not allow this. So they voted in, 
in favor of not waiving Rule 40. So out of coaching season will not be allowed by anyone in the TVL. Um, and that is really for, I mean, so many reasons, but um, liability, you know, do you pay a fee all, you know, all year if you're going to play a certain sport all year? Are coaches paid all year then? Um, you know, how do you monitor that with, you know, we aren't playing football right now, but if we allow them to have out of season coaching, then boys lacrosse, girls lacrosse, all the spring sports would really um, want the same thing. So as a league, they decided not to allow this. So on Wednesday and Thursday of last week, I met with the Dover and Sherburne Board of Health. Um, as I know you saw their advisory, but I thought there were a few important things to point out. Um, they were very adamant on cohorts aligning with the ninth and 10th grade and 11th and 12th grade cohorts that we have in school. And um, there should be no unofficial practices or scrimmages within teams or other schools. So a big concern right now is Wednesdays because we are remote and the campus is closed for cleaning and there are no practices. Um, so that was a big point that they pointed out, rightfully so, and um, is a big reason why we chose to disinfect the turf field that day. Granted, we have a lot of other beautiful fields, um, but if this is approved, we really, I think Maggie said it in um, last week's meeting, we have just so much more leverage to hold our student athletes accountable that if they have a season and they show up on Wednesday, there will be consequences. Um, and right now, I know there have been emails sent and concerns about unofficial practices or scrimmages or captain's practices. And right now, you know, they, every other season, they would be playing their sport at this moment in time. So right now we don't quite have that leverage that we would have if we had a season in place starting in September, late September, to keep them accountable. They stated that no gator or buff mask should be allowed. Bearing any change in overall community pre prevalence of COVID-19, cross country and golf may return to practices and competitions as scheduled being a low risk sport. Um, and that prior to the start of competitions for field hockey and soccer, they recommended that there should be an interim evaluation of community prevalence in Dover and Sherborne, as well as the other communities in our pod. This evaluation will take place on October 7th, which is three days before the start of the season for those sports. Um, so they will look at the different numbers of Dedham, Westwood, Medfield, Millis, and Norwood. Um, and if they feel that it is not safe for us to host or travel to those places, our game could be postponed and or canceled. Decisions regarding competition will be based off of the DESE green, yellow, red model of community risk. Um, and while this isn't written in the advisory, Dover was very adamant on the TVL ruling that no spectators should be permitted to games or practices. So that is it in a nutshell, a very large nutshell. Um, Emily, but, I really, um, really, really, really appreciate the thorough, comprehensive, detailed explanation that you have provided to our members and to all the community members who have joined us tonight. Um, I do know, as many of my colleagues on the school committee have heard, we have heard from many community members who, who wish that they could be spectators, who wish that there could be 11 kids on a field hockey team, and who wish that everything was different. And, you know, I, I think, you know, many of those decisions are outside of our control as the local school committee, certainly, certainly for you guys as the local team. It, it isn't in our purview to decide how many players can be on a soccer or a field hockey team. It, it isn't in our purview to be able to say that we want spectators. So to the end that you guys have done a remarkable job of getting this very complicated situation off the ground, I wanna say a huge thank you. Um, and I wanna ask our members, what questions do you have? Ann? Um, I have two, well, one quick point and then a quick question. Um, my point is, I understand that uh, and appreciate that once we adopt this, then there's much more leverage for players and, um, who are playing, currently playing on the fields. But I, I wonder if the fact that we adopted 
that because I've heard that there have been people playing without masks and we have adopted that um, on our campuses. So I'm wondering if maybe th that that's something that could be used as leverage if, they, if people are in fact playing without masks. Um, I guess after tonight's vote, it doesn't really matter because if we vote this in, then we've got this, but that was just a, a quick thought. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, what if a school, another school has different rules than ours? The big one I was that note, stuck out to me was the gators. So if another school allows their players to have gators, but ours don't, and they come to DS, do they have to follow our rules? Yeah, so the TVL has discussed this because I would say about half are like us as of right now and have strictly said no gators. Um, so we are talking about just banning gators completely. Um, and I think everyone is in favor of that. So I, I think that's something that we're definitely talking about and considering. And like you said, if someone came to school um, to DS to play a soccer game with a gator on, can we make them wear a different mask? And um, that is something that we're definitely discussing as a league to make part of our guidelines. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Judy? Hi. Yeah, Emily, thank you so much. This was a really thorough and fabulous presentation. My one question is, and, and I don't have a point of view on this, but I wondered what you are thinking in terms of enforcement mechanisms. You know, for example, you know, kids on a team decide they're going to all get together in their backyard and practice 14 hours a week um not wearing masks um what you know and is that against the rules and what are you what are you going to do and how are you this seems very complicated to me and so what have you thought about in terms of that yeah so our t i mean in preseason they're going to be practicing every day but wednesday so you know hopefully a two hour practice is going to wear them out enough that they go home and do their homework and have something to eat and go to bed so I do think right now maybe maybe they're doing that because they don't have anything right now structured and safe to wear them out. And if we're able to offer something structured and safe where coaches are um, understand the rules and uh, Matt with and Kay both have said that they would do some sort of a COVID uh, training with our coaches, which would be great to really help them understand, you know, creating this culture of mask wearing. Um, I do think providing that structure will definitely eliminate the practices on campus because that is our campus but at someone's house or something like that um, it really would be no different than something like a spaghetti dinner which we just can't have this um, this fall um, and we'll visit you know the winter and spring later but spaghetti dinners things like that different get-togethers after team dinners um, or a practice at someone's house is they're just not going to be permitted so you know, if we hear about them, we'll definitely have to deal with that and um, talk about different consequences of whether that means, you know, I think the consequences would be severe because this is very severe. Um, and the student athletes are really gonna be held accountable, especially our captains at really leading the charge in all of this. Maggie, can I add one thing to that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, Sandra. So the, um, in my conversations with Emily and with John, um, quite honestly, I don't think it's a secret. I was not a big fan of, of coming back to athletics while we're just trying to get this train rolling of just in-person education two days a week. Uh, I have come around to uh, really to what all of you said at the last meeting and what I've heard from some families about the, the merits of athletics. But I have to tell you, I, I personally, as the superintendent, am gonna have a very short uh, leash on this. I, I don't think it's asking that much to say to the kids, look, these things are non-negotiable. We're not talking about you know, a chant that irritates some members of our fan base. We're talking about taking chances with people's lives and we're not doing it. It just is not optional. And that's, I know Matt um, was, uh, and the boards of health have been very strong about that. And I'm, I, I give Emily a ton of credit for sticking to it and advocating for the kids. But now it's the kids turn to demonstrate for us 
that they are, uh, as a gesture of good faith, also going to take it serious and police each other. And I think they will. I, my prediction is that they will. But I, but I'm, I'm counting on John and and uh, Emily and our coaches to hold them accountable, and for the families also to hold uh, them accountable. Because we've said this a million times, this is only going to be successful to the degree that the whole community um, follows the rules, the whole school community across the board. And it is worrisome that we'll be playing against other teams where they may not have the same uh, set of standards. But I'm, I'm still, I'm really confident. I think the Tri-Valley League is very like-minded on this. John, you might be able to speak to the way the principals have felt about this. You've been in meetings with them. There were principals who were not in favor of this who came around. So I yeah, think absolutely. Hold the kids accountable. Yep. Maggie, if I can, what, one of the points I wanted to bring up too is just like Emily, I am in support of this plan because I, one of the concerns I have that I've been hearing is kids were going out of state, kids were going here, they were traveling to different tournaments all over the place. I think this plan provides a level of, of structure. Now that doesn't mean that some families won't maybe decide to take their child to a certain place and, and do those things, but I truly believe that providing our kids with a structured opportunity for the sports, the outlet, the passion, um, far outweighs you know, some of the, the potential negatives. Now that being said, I completely agree with Dr. Keogh, there will be an incredibly short leash. And it may be the situation where Emily and I have already had conversations about this. We, we could pull a team. You know, if there is a team that is not following or abiding by this, they would be pulled, not, not the other people, not the people who are doing what they're supposed to do. I think the other thing too with the principals you know, we saw last spring the, the fact that the students lost the opportunity for socialization, for engagement, uh, for opportunities to um, work together on something. A lot of our uh, student athletes have put together countless hours training for these sports and they're really passionate about it and they represent our school well. And they're gonna have to continue to do that in albeit an imperfect situation, we still feel as though it does provide them with an opportunity to play the game that they love. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I think the thing that I've heard from both, from all three of you that really resonates with me is that moving forward with athletic contests in the time of COVID really is a call to action for our students and for those students leader, student leaders. I know many of us received letters from the captains of the various sports and those folks, you know, we all have their names and their emails, and those are the folks that we're gonna turn to, to hold one another accountable and to our families. You know, if kids are having a practice in a backyard, ostensibly that backyard belongs to a grown up, and it would be our collective expectation that we would not be having those private and potentially um, not socially distanced and unsafe extra practices. It's not worth the extra when it would cost the opportunity for everybody else. So um, to, to the extent that, that we could possibly make this happen, that'd be really exciting. Other questions from the members? Michael and then Lynn. I have um, a comment and then a, a couple of questions. Um, first, I, I thank many, many thanks. I know that this has been an extremely complicated process, uh, Emily and, and John. Um, and and Matt to uh, to work through it. So thank you so much for the, the hard work that uh, that's been done uh, to date. Um, I'm, I'm very strongly supportive of having the opportunity for sport. Um, at the same time, um, I'm also quite concerned and um, I'm sorry to say skeptical about the um, uh, the. Uh, prognosis for compliance. Um, I think if, if we take a look on social media and we see some of our student leaders um, who have been um, uh, kind of very publicly and visibly um, um, uh, contravening the basic uh, distancing and, and masking, masking protocols, um, I'm concerned about the, the school staying open overall. And um, I'm hopeful that the uh, opportunity for a sport and, and the messaging to the, to the student athletes um, is that it's not just 
not following the sport protocols that may lose the sport privilege, but if you're not following the basic COVID hygiene principles um, outside of school, you may also or will also lose the opportunity to participate in sport. I don't know if that's has been discussed or if that's contemplated. Yeah, definitely. I'm. I think the student athletes, as captains, and all of our student athletes need to adhere to all of the guidelines that are in place, whether it's within their sport or within their social life. Um, I think one of the big pushing factors that we can instill in our student athletes was really well put by our board of health. I think it was Matt or Matt or Kay who said it that we don't want to just start this season. We want to end this season and we want to continue on to the winter season and to the spring season and to the fall two season. So I think it's so important for our student athletes to that be hammered in their head that we don't want to just play Dedham the first weekend. We want to play all 10 games. And in order to do that, you guys need to adhere to the guidelines. And it is extremely serious if you don't and could jeopardize our fall sports as well as our winter, fall two and spring sports. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the question for, for Matt um, Vitale, um, assuming that there are uh, schools that we're playing against that do not have a Gator prohibition, um, are you comfortable uh, competing against those schools? Um, what, what I would say is, uh, I will prognosticate a little bit. I'm not the Dover Board of Health, but I, I think it's hard for me to imagine that they would say we are more comfortable with kids coming from out of town and not adhering to our guidance, um, potentially with something that may perform more poorly. I think the Gator data is increasingly mixed, but I would say if it's our rule, I think our expectation would be that student athletes who came to play on our fields and kind of came in and, and did that in our sanctioned areas we'd expect them to adhere to the local guidance. And so I think like one-way valves, gators, those pieces would all be things we'd look to. I think my recollection is the Tri-Valley League already excludes the exhalation valve masks. Um, but if they didn't, I would include that in the same bucket. And so from a, from a safety standpoint for our student athletes, um, a situation where we may be, let's just uh, uh, pick on Norton, uh, traveling to Norton playing soccer and um, uh, Norton does not have, let's assume Norton does not have a, a mask rule. They, they permit buffs um, and that's what the students are at, from Norton are wearing. Um, are, is, is there comfort from the, the Board of Health or the medical standpoint that our kids, uh, our student athletes are safe in that setting? So what I would say is there's always this tension because like as a parent of young kids and as a doctor and board of health, you're like, let me control everything. I can just pick you up and move you here and manage it. And I think that the reality is for our adolescent student athletes, like finding the balance and being more flexible and explaining the why feels like it's one of the strategies. And I sort of talk to the parents of older kids about their experience as we thought about the advisory. So what I would say is I think we really have a clear regulatory authority for things that happen within the confines of town. I would say that the data about, is this an absolute safety threshold for the buffs? I think it's the right thing to do, but I don't think the data is so clear that I would say, boy, Norton, Norton has buffs, you know, we can't go, or that's an, a place that we would extend it. I think not wearing my board of health hat, but kind of wearing the doctor hat, I would say, I think we wanna have good strategies, but the risks associated with a buff wearing uh, out of town game in an outdoor environment with the distancing that's been recommended by the kind of league and the state, I think is probably a low risk contact, um, particularly if some of the buff data has evolved. But if we kind of went to a, a team where they said every kid on the team has a medical exemption, then we shouldn't play that team. That, that could be dangerous for a student athlete. Thank you. Um, and Emily, I just I, I wanted to um, clarify one of the, the points in, in one of the slides regarding um, uh, cohorts and varsity and JV. Um, do, do I understand correctly that the while the uh, 9th and 10th graders and 11th and 12th graders will be um, separately cohorted and practicing that they will um, 
potentially or in fact be mixed for for games to the extent you would have uh, 10th or 11th, 12th JV and 9th, 10th varsity? Right. So on a varsity team, you could have a 9th and 10th grader on there. So throughout practice, they would only do drills and compete within their cohort of 10 or less 9th and 10th graders, um, where the other cohorts would be 11th and 12th graders. I don't see this impacting varsity or JV sports as much, but the few, um, you know, you have a handful or so of ninth and 10th graders that do play up. So come game time, you are bringing in another town. Um, and so you are going to play, you know, who needs to play in that game. So a ninth grader could be starting with an 11th and 12th graders, you know, depending on who are the best players. Um, but you are incorporating another town. So talking with the Board of Health and the MIA and our TVL League, it really, we're trying to control as much as we can. Um, throughout practices, it is in our control to remain in those cohorts. Come a game, you're bringing in another town um, and you know you lose a little bit of that control to be played in those cohorts. Um, field hockey and soccer are two in particular that the varsity teams um, are gonna have some ninth and 10th graders on their varsity, possibly. Thank you. Um, final question um, is, has there been consideration for the large uh, cross country to uh, have JV and varsity or the other schools don't really have the, the depth for those? Yeah, they, they don't have the, the numbers that we do within our pod. Um, I think, you know, Westwood might have quite a few boys, but their girls don't or vice versa. Um, so they haven't, um, for, you know, talked about the JV because I, it's probably us and Hopkinton who can support those and Hopkinton's in the other pod. So it wouldn't work so much. Um, but the cross country coaches and I have talked um, about, um, you know, different strategies that we can use to um, make it the best experience as possible. Um, and I'll post this meeting. We'll be discussing it further too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lynn. Michael asked my question. Oh, there you go. The question, I had the same question about the how does a mixed grade team varsity team work, but you answered it. Thank you. Also, I wanted to say if you weren't able to solve Rubik's cubes previously, you probably can now and should try. <laughs> I definitely can. <laughs> yeah, I bet you can now. <laughs> I'll try it. We'll see. Um, all right. Well, I will say that there is competitive Rubik's cubing in the world, and I bet you could do that in a very socially distanced and safe way. So maybe we think about adding a Rubik's cube team to our sport. <laughs> all right. Other questions? Anne? I, sorry, coming back. And Kate. Oh, Anne, then Kate, and then we'll, we'll, yeah. Kate should go first since she hasn't asked yet. Go ahead. Okay, Kate. Thank you, and I'm sorry for my spotty connection up here in rural Vermont. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, and Emily, it, it, um, as everyone else has said, the work that's been done on, on your side and the boards of health, uh, it's amazing and detailed and we're so appreciative. Um, I, I'm curious, and I'm sorry if maybe you spoke to this and I missed it due, due to my spotty reception, but. Do we have all coaches back on board? Are we okay on that end? As of right now, we do. Um, it will, we will need to see pending approval, um, but as of right now, we do. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. Anne. Okay, thanks, Sue. Um, and I apologize, but I was remiss. Emily, I did not say earlier, thank you so much. I cannot believe how complicated this all looks. I know how hard it is in a regular season to schedule all the matches, and this looks like it was 10 times more complicated. Um, I have a quick question about cross country in that because the team is so big and you talked about the, and I can't remember the distance, the 14 feet between groups. Um, so is that something that you and the coaches are going to be like creating areas up in the backfield? Right. Um, so that they can be, because they're going to be like 10 different groups of 10 or more. 
Yeah, that's correct. So um, we have discussed different options for practice, whether that's, you know, ninth and 10th graders practice on Monday, Tuesday, because that's when they're in. And then they really are with their cohort and 11th and 12th graders go Thursday, Friday. Um, and then they really stick to those. And then you have about 50 on each day um, and girls and boys split up. Um, but we do have another field, Junction Street, unfortunately, is going to be used by our football team right now. So we do have that field um, to use for social distance and gathering. Um, our soccer fields will be used um, throughout up on the upper fields by our soccer teams, but um, they generally gather around the baseball diamonds. And I just found out tonight field hockey, youth field hockey is going to be using a town field instead. So we also will have that field hockey field, the youth field hockey field right there for our, um, our cross country team to socially distance there and um, in the Junction Street field as well. So um, depending on the model that the coaches and I come, you know, talk about what they want to do, um, I think we can make it work if it's, you know, splitting the groups up into two different practice sessions. Thank, thank you. And then a quick question or not well, sort of question. And this is more for John. Um, maybe Andrew, I've heard when, when people started hearing about the sports being talked about for starting back up, now the questions are starting about, well, what about performing arts? Is that then sort of the next, is that anywhere on your radar at all? And I know that. Yeah, no, yeah, Ms. Hovey, it's an excellent question. And it's certainly something that's, yeah, definitely on my radar because we're also then looking at clubs and all of those things. So right now, the DESE um, guidance that we're receiving is because the, the drama traditionally is indoors, that they don't want us to run what would be the traditional drama programs indoors. Now, could we get creative and look at outdoor venues, social distancing? I think the answer is yes. And I think that we probably should look into how we could incorporate that because I also recognize athletics are important for our kids, drama is important for our kids, and I wanna provide as many opportunities as possible. So that would be, yes, the next logical step for us to look at how can we make that happen that is also in line with our respective boards of health who have done a tremendous amount of work, and I can't thank Dr. Vitali enough. Um, his, his knowledge is just, it's just phenomenal, and just his common sense basis of here's how we should be approaching these things has really been helpful for me as a school leader. Uh, but then also the, um, the, some of our clubs as well. So right now we're starting our clubs remotely, um, but maybe at some point we get to a point where we can start doing some of those in person. Can I, can I add something sure. on the drama front? Sure. Um, just because I was, happened to be talking to people um, I was talking to, uh, I was corresponding with Jeff Herman, and I understand that for the fall play, um, Carmel Bergeron is thinking about a radio play, um, which works nicely social distanced. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also um, coming up with social distanced ways to do like a musical review possibly for the, for the middle school. They did a completely remote um, this summer, three plays completely remotely, and it was worked out really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that Jeff is, I understand, is working on that and is going to come and, you know, talk to you guys about that. Look forward to it. That's great. All right. Um, so without further ado, um, Doug, I see your hand up. So this is the part of the meeting where just the school committee can talk. I, I'm not trying to ignore you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, please do reach out to any one of us and we'll see whether or not we can get your question answered or connect, connect you with the right person. Um, so I'm wondering if I could entertain a motion to approve the um, proposal for the return to fall sports as outlined in our packets and reviewed in, in wonderful detail by Ms. Sherman tonight. Hear that? I, I can now. What did you oh, say? Oh, sorry, Ann Hubby. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Anne. A motion by Ann. Do I have a second? Kate Potter second. Okay, Kate Potter second. And is there any discussion?
Okay. Um, just take yourself to the roll call vote. I, I do just in matter of discussion want to say to, to all the school administrators, to John, to Andrew, and obviously to Emily, to all the coaches, to all the people, this is a huge undertaking and we will keep our fingers crossed and each of us who are parents will keep our children under watch and we will try to make this the most responsible opportunity for our students to show us who they really are to Mike to Michael's points tonight um so that they can live up to the goals that we've set forth and finish the season as as both boards of health have have mentioned um Judy Judy Miller yes Kate Potter Kate Potter yes Lynn Collins Lynn Collins yes Michael Jaffe Michael Jaffe yes Ann Hovey Ann Hovey yes and Maggie Sharon, yes. Okay. So I believe, um, unless I am missing something, that that concludes our, our business for tonight. Am I correct, Andrew? That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank no, you, everyone, for your No support. problem. Yes, thank you guys all so much. I can't, I mean, I've, I've heard from a lot of student athletes, a lot of coaches, and myself included. Um, I know it means so much to these students and they're so longing for this opportunity. So I can't thank you all enough for the time. Um, and so I will take this moment since we have 52 participants and I see many, many of the parents of the sport captains and other athletes on here to say, please, as you heard tonight, do not entertain 20, 30 athletes in your backyards, not wearing masks. Please do not do that because when you do that, you're going to make this opportunity for all these students be not an opportunity. And, and that's not really what we're hoping for tonight. So, so we implore you, you know, obviously as Mr. Jaffe has mentioned, social media is, is a beast. And so Instagramming and Snapchatting these activities is a bad idea, but more than the social media part being a bad idea, it's a bad idea to be doing these things because they put your fellow student athletes at risk. So if we're gonna do this, let's go. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Mrs. O'Connell, I see, I, that's wonderful. All right, motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, so moved. Judy Miller, motion to adjourn, Lynn Collins second. <laughs> Great, Ann Hovey. Uh, yes. Michael Jaffe. Michael Jaffe, yes. Judy Miller. Judy Miller, yes. Lynn Collins. Lynn Collins, yes. Kate Potter. Kate Potter, yes. And Maggie Sharon, yes. And with that, we are adjourned at 8.35. Thank you so much. Okay.